to remind us of you, of your ways, of your wisdom and counsel. And also to instruct us further in the way we are to go. We thank you for your word, which so often is needed to inspire us to faith, to greater understanding, to live by faith and not by mere sight. And we ask that you would help us to comprehend once again, even as we begin uh, Sunday school this morning. We th give thanks for your mercy, for sparing, for preserving, and for restoration of many who took ill this week. Uh, we ask that you would bless us as we take time to read the Scriptures together. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, uh, let's turn to the book of Ephesians once again. And uh, I love the way how Paul takes up the study of doctrine. He doesn't uh, write it as, okay, this is a subject. And then, okay, this is the doctrine of salvation. This is a doctrine of God. This is a doctrine of Christ. This is a doctrine of Holy Spirit. This is a doctrine of so and so forth. Not that there are not books like that there. You can go and buy books like that and you can, uh, you can almost read yourself. At, it's, it's not only hard to read, it can, your soul can be sapped out. It just, it can be challenging. It's just technical. It's just theoretical. He teaches doctrine. He writes of truth integrated in the context of life. And that's how we must always study the Lord's Word, in the context of life itself. Never to separate it. Okay, and then this is so important, ever more so important today. Right? Unfortunately, today, teaching and my personal life doesn't necessarily go together which is most unfortunate, right? So the teacher can teach, okay, this is what you got to do, this is what we must be, this is, it does not necessarily apply to me personally. This is my personal life. And my personal life can be messed up and it's, I'm still a teacher, which is painful, right? But go back to how teachers were meant to be. God taught how teachers were meant to be, right? They were meant to be teachers by and through their own life. This is so important, ever so important. The idea of teaching is closely related to shepherding. Now, how does that work out? Okay. Uh, come January, uh, uh, the pastoral team will be uh, going over to India once again for their church family camp. And the topic that we will be studying and, and hoping to, uh, to learn from and to share and to apply is none other than how the Lord Jesus Christ was not only that great teacher-preacher, but that shepherd. The work of shepherding. On the one hand, this is it's not just for, it's not a pastoral conference. It, it isn't. If it's pastoral conference, okay, this is shepherd. But what is, what is it going to do with the rest of us? Oh, it has. Because this is the part. The shepherd feed the flock, right? This is the easy. But the flock must know how to feed. <laughs> this is where you see the two parts must meet. Right? So the, the shepherd needs to know how to feed the flock. The flock must learn how to take whatever is being presented and know how to huh, digest it and how to, okay, benefit from it. Now we assume, okay, shepherd feed, flock will know how to eat. Not always. <laughs> right? 
right? If you have children, when they are very, very young, you look at it, you, you put the food on the table, they stare at it. As if the food get to go into their body. They got to learn how to cut. All right, how do I take this? How do I eat? How do I eat without making... Uh, you know, there's more food on the floor than there's food on, in their mouth. And that's always the concern of every parent. I'll take that illustration to a Christian. Same thing. I'm going to know the Word of God. Yeah, yeah, it's been te- taught every Sunday. Eh, how come I don't benefit at all? How, where, where in it is it in, in, in my strength? Is, where is the result of it in my life? Somewhere, somehow, it's not uh, going in. And so Paul wrote, this is why he must write to the, whether it's to the Ephesians, to the Colossians, to, he wrote to them to help them. Now, this is a wonderful, glorious truth, it's salvation. How do we process it? How do we understand it? How do we digest it? How do we apply it? And how does it and must into our own life. So you've got to see the two parts coming together. Okay? I, I, I look at it from two parts. One, the teacher's perspective, which I look at it from that angle. But I also look at it from the sheep perspective. Now, how do I? Because very much so, I am also sheep. The Lord Jesus Christ, great shepherd. Isn't it? Okay, now how do I take the word of God? How do I feed my soul? And this is ever so important ever so important. Okay? Because next Sunday's message is going to be very interesting, really interesting. Because here is Isaiah, the servant of God, taught, teaching them. And the people, so see, to Isaiah, this is so wonderful, this is so rich, this is the Messiah, perspective teacher. You want it's the people's response. Wow, this is precept upon you. It's a rule. This is rule. This is must do this, must do that. They got it all wrong. They saw one, something so rich as just a set of rules. Oh, I've got to do this. I've got to do that. I've got to... They misread. There is a loss in translation somewhere. And they couldn't. For the life of them, they hear the word of God, they stumble in their life. What's the problem? Wow, that was a challenging text to study. Okay, this is next week's message if you are here. But the principle of it, it applies right to what we are looking at. Right? So we always tell people, if you want to be a teacher of the Lord's Word and you don't come for worship, please, what's wrong with you? You know, you're not interested in worship, I just want to come and teach. See, you can actually separate your life and you don't even want to feed your own soul. How are you going to feed the flock? So we must ask teachers who are like that, please reconsider, rethink what you are doing. Obviously. Can you imagine only, of course, now is a little bit easier in that sense. Because I'm the only one who here, here, here. Can you imagine one day, I'm not, okay, somebody else, there are other pastors, maybe another pastor preach. The day somebody else, I'm absent. Like Pastor Charlie, he comes here and he teach, and then, hooray, he teach. I am going to, uh, you know, not attend worship. Then you're just doing a job. I'll be happy. So when people say, well, he, Pastor Charlie is coming, are you stressed? No, happy. Why? I get to sit down and sit down there and yeah. see the world's perspective, and uh, it's so different. Right? The world's perspective, your boss coming, you know, you panic, you gotta look. This is not world. This is spiritual. This is different. This is wonderful. You, you don't believe me, okay, you don't believe me, but it is there anyway. It is wonderful. You get to read, well, you get to learn, so that's great. So it doesn't come back to uh, February sometime, I think, January. January. You see, the whole idea, and it's, can I, can I teach and feed my soul? Yes. Can I be just feeding my soul, somebody else teach? 
wonderfully yes to. Such is the word of the Lord. But if you don't, you can die in service. You, know? you can actually die in service. I just, I'm serving, but my soul is not fed. I am not learning anything. Right? I look back the whole year, December now, I reflect. Down memory lane coming soon. So as much as I encourage people, take time to reflect this year. Take time to, I, I go into reflection mode too, before even Christmas comes. And the reflection is not what I have taught, it's what I have learned. What has God taught this year that I have actually learned? And that can be sobering very often because we <laughs> didn't learn a thing. What have I learned? What have I really learned? And it's wonderful to trace back and say, this is, this is what God has been teaching. You see it in the context of life all the time. Never just textbook study. Okay? So when we take a look at Ephesians, when, uh, look how Paul writes the way he does. And I uh, begin to appreciate this a little bit more with each passing year. And he says in chapter 2, see chapter 1 is, is you know, we, we ought to know the great salvation plan of God. We ought to, and it's so rich. Ch that's chapter one, right? God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And then he expounds on that wonderful truth. From God's plan of calling, choosing us before the foundation of the world in love. That is just so profound. He drew us to Himself. He, you know, he forgave us of our sins. He adopted us as sons and daughters of God. So rich. Every word must not fall to the ground. Every word must be carefully, wonderfully received and processed. He ends up with truly being the, the idea of the church, the body of Christ, the honour, the exaltation of Christ, and yet our greatest identification as a church is to be identified with Christ. That to me is the highest honour. That is just so wonderfully rich. Right? Now, chapter 2 is so different. Chapter 2 is, even when he has said all these things, people can take for granted. We can take for granted salvation. And so chapter 2 goes into contrast. If we forget what we are being saved from, And so Paul uh, you know, lists down a number of things to talk about. You know, this is what we have been saved from. We have been saved from the power of sin. Have we not? You know, look, you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Sin makes us spiritually dead. Right? Sin has a powerful will of its own. Yeah, we don't realize how powerful sin is until you try to... You can't even stop it. Look at, look at verse 3, and he states it very candidly. Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, Now, this is interesting. The word, uh, you know, the lust of the flesh, the desires of uh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh. This idea here is that of the will. Our human will can, is under sin affects, affected badly. You once conducted, you know, how come I can't help myself? How come it's so hard? Flesh. 
Here is the power of sin. In other words, it has a will of it. It has its own agenda. It will affect your very will. This is the Romans 7. How come I will to do the good I don't do? How come I know that this is no good that I do? What is wrong with me? <laughs> it's called the flesh. And the flesh can be badly affected by this thing called sin. And it is. Right? And this is something that we must never take for granted. Therein is the power of salvation. Wherein is the power? The power is over sin. And so Paul writes about how we can be freed. We can die to sin. Romans 6, Romans 8, freed. He teaches very, very carefully how we can be freed. And it takes none other than the power of the Spirit of God. There's a law of sin. That's how powerful it is, as if it is a law. Here is called the law of the Spirit of life. We may not be, okay, this is, this is how deceptive sin can be. You look at, but I am saved, not like the Gentiles. You know, they get drunk, they do stupid things. You can have what is called the sin of the self-righteousness. This was the Jews they were guilty of, the sin of hypocrisy, the sin of condemn, you know, inside them, very condemnative spirit, very self-righteous spirit. They can see the sins of everybody else, but they cannot see their own. On the outside, look religious, very religious, very pious, but inside they are no better. They envy other people. Yet, okay, I better not do it. But inside, they envy. They covet. You cannot save yourself from your sins. And so Paul wrote, this is what it does. See, sin will make you spiritually dead. Dead to God, in other words. How come I'm unresponsive to God? Even you can be at church and be unresponsive to God. How come I'm so unreceptive to God? Not that you don't understand. You do understand. Yeah, I hear, I understand, but I cannot, I just cannot respond. This problem is called sin. Yeah, you are aware of it. Are we even aware of it? Right? So he writes to, guess who Paul is writing to? Christians. To the Ephesus church. Remember this. You were dead. God made you alive. Don't go back to it. Right? So this is so important. The power, this is what we have been saved from. So we ought to examine our salvation again and again. What are we being saved from? This. All right, now, two. We are being saved from something else that is very sinister. He is called the prince of the power of the air. One, he is a ruler. Two, he has power. Three, he's invisible. There is the three things that is very disturbing of an enemy. One, a ruler that is powerful, worse, invisible. And I'm not talking about Osama bin Laden. <laughs> right? Where is this guy? Of course, he's now uh, you know, hunted down, gone. Where is this enemy? Cannot find it. He can hit you from. People are scared about this terrorist problem because you don't know who the terrorist is. Right? If you're a bit darker in color, you go airport, they, please check. If you have a beard, they will check you. Guarantee. See, they have a picture of someone. What if the per this is where you caught off guard? They don't have a face. They can look like anyone. You think this is terrorist? It is not. Right? There was a video that is talk about, you know, don't, don't stereotype. There's a video of a man, he, you know, he's got a beard, he was carrying a backpack, and he was walking. His face looked fierce. And then. You know, this person looking, 
scared. You know, all kind of crazy thoughts come. Backpack, beard, right? Middle Eastern kind of uh, you know, background. Already afraid. And then this person walking towards. And then worse, saw policemen running after. Confirm, this is terrorist. And then here's the video. And I ran past him, arrested a Caucasian guy. And he's, hey, who is this man? Wong sees the child, carries the child, open the backpack, bring out a pair of roller skates for the child. It's in where is the end? You don't even know who it is. What does it look like? But of course, this is none other than the evil one. What does he do? And Paul writes very, very candidly what he writes. We, we, we talked about this in 2 Corinthians 4. He is the power that is behind this world age. Influencing. So my great concern is not Pokemon Go. My great concern is what is behind influencing this present generation. Not just the vices, but the person who is behind all the time. And very crafty, very subtle. And it's not just young people he influences. Older ones too. Right? The target is... Huh, you're retired, you got a lot of money, what do you do with yourself? Oh, the mind can go all crazy, oh, distracted by so many things in life. Very easy. You have no time for God, of course, you're busy all over the place. When you're working, you're busy. When you're retired, you're even more busy. You're busy enjoying yourself. At the end of life, you got nothing to show for. Ah, it's a sad... You see? It may not be sin. I didn't sin against God. No, no, you didn't. But watch something else. Influence. Look at this influence. Look, he causes blindness. That is terrible. You can't see. You can't see what you're doing is wrong. You think you are right. You think you have an answer, you justify yourself, you reason your, uh, yourself. But this is, you know, I'm not sinning against God, and, yeah, I deserve it. I, oh, yeah, you can say all those things, but still blind. That's what Jesus said to Peter. Do you know you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of man? And you know who's behind that? Get thee behind me, Satan. Satan can come in and subtly, you're just so caught up with the things of man. What about the things of God? Oh, yeah, 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 I go to church. Yeah, I, th I, th I, I share my faith, you know. I, I invite people to church. That's called being mindful of the things of God. We have reduced it to so superficial, so shallow, that we don't even know what the things of God are. That can come if we are not careful. Right? Look at how Paul writes to his brethren, the e Ephesus church, because he knows these dangers are there. Okay? Now, he tells them, this is what it is. Okay? According, see, you once walked according. You once did it. What? Don't go back. Don't go back to your old ways. Don't go back to the world. Oh, but I'm not in the world. We like to think that we're not in the world. We're not worldly. But all our deeds, our thoughts, our actions can betray us. What are we mindful of? What are we really conscious about? See, these are the challenges that we often uh, don't realize until someone like the Apostle Paul uh, writes it as candid, as straight to the point as possible to help people think. And then he says, uh, yep, look, the spirit now, see, this is a spiritual being. This is not uh, uh, just accident, coincidence, not just influence. Oh no, far more deadly than that. 
This is in the spiritual realm. The spirit who now works, he is actively working in the son's obedience. See, the heart is defiant. How do I know this has already affected me? Watch your heart. Watch your own spirit. You, you know, but you don't do. Disobedience to God. Disobedient to the Word of God. Psalm 119 begins, You have commanded us to keep your precepts diligently. How many of us can say we have kept the Word of God diligently? You know how disobedient we can be? And we expect God to bless us. God, why are you not hearing my prayers? Have you kept my word? That's the reply. Have you kept my word? You have commanded. And so the psalmist looks at it and admits, I haven't. How can a young man cleanse his word? I understand now. By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart, I need to seek you. Not when I'm desperate. Oh, God, God. all right. Oh, I'm in trouble. Oh, give me my whole verse. Give me my whole verse. Yeah, help me. Comfort me. Yeah, deliver me. <laughs> That's not keeping. That's called being desperate. Unfortunately, we can deceive ourselves. And so Paul writes how, look at this, God, right? Among, we conducted ourselves like this, fulfilling the lust of our flesh, the, the desires of our flesh. It's all flesh. What, is, what, what, do we, what drives us? What really drives us? Is it not the things of this world? Have you ever asked what drives you? Or you can be very noble about, you know, I want to do well, I want to do this, or provide for my family, I want to do that. All right, it sounds good. It really does. But deep down, what drives you is the lust of the flesh. That love for God isn't there. John, uh, is it like Paul? This is why they are, all the apostles are like-minded. He told them, love not the world or the things of the world. The pride of life, the loss of the flesh. These things are ah, the world. Don't love it. Your heart is drawn to it. If you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. Do you understand that? You're already drawn there. Your heart is already cold. The love of the Father is long gone. If the love of the Father is there, anything to do with the Word of God, anything to do with the Lord Jesus Christ, you love as in love. This is John chapter 14. You love me, you will keep my word, commandment. You say you love me, you will keep my word. It's very, very straightforward. You know what? You don't love me. Is it possible? Where once you love the Lord so deeply, so passionately, and then it fades you have left your first love. The book of Revelation tells us that that is exactly what happened to the Ephesian church. You can serve the Lord without a heart of love. You can do this. You can defend truth. You can say, wow, I am against false teaching. Great. But Jesus said, I have this one thing against you. You have left your first love where once you serve with a great heart of love, you think nothing of giving up anything to serve the Lord. You think, well, is it inconvenient? Of course not, nothing. You think nothing of it. Such was your driving force, love. Now I remember what love can do. This was a friend of mine. We were in high school. This is a boy. It was just a friend of mine so in love with this girl. 
He actually bothered to learn how to make sushi and wrap it up nicely and then ride his bicycle to drop off. You know, I, I, I stayed with him. I said, you never made me sushi and you call me friend. What changed you? He was just so in love. This is what first love is. He'd do anything. Just put down there, ding dong, and ride back. Ha! Huh? You didn't even... What do you cook for me? Indomie. And you took time to boil the rice. You know it's how hard it is to make sushi? You, you don't realize how hard it is until you try it. The rice must be done in a certain way, a certain temperature. You know, he failed so many times, he didn't give up. Until he perfected it, okay, this is fitting to, uh, you know, court this girl. No, no, not boyfriend, girlfriend yet. You see, that's the danger. Moment, ah, die, everything dies there. You know, love is what it should be, a love for God. What has replaced it? Sin. Dead. What has replaced it? The world. That can happen. A love for the world. If we dare to admit. And so we need to be saved. Lord, have mercy. Look at this. And so we go back to this thing here. Verse 4. But God... Is there hope? Yes, but God, who is rich in mercy. Can I, can God, yeah, I'm really at wretched, you know, I'm so caught up with the world. And this is the wonderful truth. God, who is rich in mercy. You God, was God still even... Would God even want to save me? Again? How many times now? He saved me once, and then backslide, go back to the world. Will He save me again? Understand this text. God who is rich in mercy. The word mercy is not just an Old Testament word. It is a New Testament. It is a universal truth. We call these gnomic truths. In other words, timeless. A God who is rich in mercy. How do I understand this mercy? Now, because. Why would He be so merciful? And then there's the word because. Because of His great love with which He loved us. There is your because. Really? God, I failed you. I get caught up with sin again. I get caught up with the world again. I was so blind to it. I thought I was all right. I thought it was just, you reason all these things out until you can't reason anymore. It is what it is. And then you feel guilty. And then, oh, I, I, I better just, like Peter, I go back, I go back fishing. I go back to my old ways, in other words. You know, I go back to my old life. I'm no longer fit to serve God. I'm no longer fit to be Peter. I go back to being Simon, son of Jonah. I'm no longer fit to be Peter, son of God. Oh no, here comes the Lord Jesus Christ and asks him a very, very simple question. Peter, do you love me more than these things? More than the world? Okay, these things is not fishing, okay? You, you mustn't... These things, it's masculine, actually. It will tell you, Jesus was not comparing uh, love for me and fishing. That would be an insult. It was people, his friends. His friends. Remember, it was his friends that were there. Peter said to his friends, at least we still got each other. We still can hang out. Let's go back to our our you know, past. And his friends say, Peter, we go with you. you. You go back, we go with you. See, loyal friends. And so at least I, I, I have something to comfort myself. My friends are still with me. And Jesus knew where he was broken and asked him, do you love me more than these? Not that, he was the one who taught that love one another. But you need a love 
that is pure, that is good, that is not of this world. A love that is of the Lord. Until you come back to that. Well, it took a while for him to be restored, but it did. That's where it begins. See, God who is rich in mercy because of His great love. That is to be an amazing, the merciful God. This is mercy. Rich in mercy. Right. Loved when we were still, you know, remember this, when we were dead in trespasses and sin, even when, verse 5, even when is even when. When did God have this great love? Even when you, we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. So grace, mercy and grace are very close together, synoptic, under the same. Very similar, not same, but just similar. You've got to see it together, then it's beautiful. So great love, Mercy. So how do I understand the mercy of God? Understand it as in His great love. Well, how do I understand uh, God's love? <laughs> mercy. Right? And then add one more. Grace. Really grace. You, we deserve judgment, but didn't get it. You got salvation instead. That's Grace. This kindness is shown to you. This love is shown to you. <laughs> right? Rather than judgment, much love and grace is shown. That's what grace is. Okay? Now this is, it, it, it's just not just definition kind. It's description. You describe it, what it is, rather than just define it. Because there is no word in the world that can fully define the mercy of God. Just the word mercy. Can't even, the word contain this is mercy. Rich in mercy. Until you see it contextually. You were dead in trespasses, <laughs> caught up with the world, and here is a God of great love. He loved us. And he avails himself. And he shows kindness. And he's, he, his promise, I will make you alive. I offer you life. You were dead. I will offer you life. Look at this life. This is wonderful. That we will be raised up together. I, I like, this is beautiful words. Right? Sin brings us down. Isn't it? Darkness down. Raise us up together. In other words, out of. Lifted out of. This is not raise up. Okay, you go to heaven now. No, no. It is raised up to a level out of this. You do not need to remain here. You are raised up together with, all right? Raise up together. Now, the key phrase here is the word together. It comes out again and again. Together, made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And this is where we are grateful, where we celebrate Christmas, where we think of our salvation. We just, there was a life without Jesus, without Christ. Power of sin is there, dead in trespasses and sin. The, the world is inside you. The influence is there behind it all. In Christ, raised out of there. Sit together with Christ in the heavenly places. The idea here is, remember heavenly places? Ephesians 1, it just talks about the spiritual realm. We are blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Raise us together in the heavenly places that's your connection. That the Lord will bless. That the Lord will love. That you are together. You are Christ. That is so special. That is so precious to see this. Right? 
He's a God who is rich in mercy. This is merciful God that He is. He Himself is a merciful God, right? This is the part. He's a merciful God. And His expressions of mercy, absolutely amazing. To love us when we are still, transgression is there. To love us even though we were spiritually dead. To love us with a great love. To make us alive together with Christ. That's the idea. You are raised up. You are now together with. God saves us. God wins us over literally by His love. Not force. And you can understand this love. You can comprehend this love. You can taste this love. You can experience this love. You are out of there. I don't want this. You know, this love is there. How does God save us? He literally saves us with His love. He wins us over with His love. You mean there is a God who is that loving? There is a God who is so great in mercy. This is the merciful God that He is. That's where we carefully explain the scriptures. We, we, we help people to see this. If you read it for yourself, you understand it for yourself. This is an amazing God. Because there's none like it. It cannot even be compared. No great love in the human level can be compared. Even the greatest merciful, most merciful deed cannot be compared. Merciful God that He is. Amazing expressions there. The riches of God's mercy saved us by His grace. He saved us, delivered us, in, in other words. Raised us up. Look at all the verbs. Saved, raised, made us sit together. So it's not you, in other words, you don't save yourself. You know? Well, I'm going to get myself out of this situation. I'm going to will it. Oh no, you just ask the Lord. Lord, would you save me? Please save me. Very simple verse in Psalm 119. Very simple prayer. Lord, I'm yours. Save me. Saved us. Made us. Blessed us. See, four things. Saved us, raised us, made us, blessed us. It's what God is doing, not what you are doing. Right? Sometimes as a Christian, you always wonder, you wonder, you get frustrated. How much more? What more can I do? What more must I do to grow my faith? Not what you do, it's what God is doing and have done. What He has done. He saved us. You just, just think about that. Just dwell on that thought by His grace. Raised us. He, God, made us, blessed us. Until your heart, your mind is soaked and saturated with that great, glorious truth. Okay, this is, this is what you know, this is what, why Paul prays, Lord, would you? The problem is we can't, we just can't see it. And even though Paul can explain, he can show, he just can't see it. And so he prays, Lord, would you open the eyes of their understanding that they may know this. What we need is to pray, Lord, open my eyes to see how truly merciful you are. You have already been. He's already showed this mercy. It's a question of whether you can see it and understand it. Now I look back how merciful God has been. That's my great uh, challenge every time. to well, For myself, I, I trace, Lord, you've really been merciful. During the week, I went to see Ron Lyons, and he has been away from church for a little while uh, because he, he fell and he broke his femur. And he's recovered, so we went out for lunch. He said, but I walk very slow. It's okay. It's all right. I have experience with you know, <laughs> those who walk very slow. I just walk slowly. Like, with you. This is practice. Uh, with you. Together. Sit together. You know, raise together. 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 And we had a wonderful time. 
And he said, yo, I have, I have very good neighbors. But you know one thing I really miss? Fellowship. That we can speak about the Lord, we can speak about faith, we can just talk about the Lord. It just, it just lifted up his heart and his mind, everything else. He wants to come to church, but he's got a medical problem right now that has, it's, he's unable to without going into too much details, and he is unable to. And so I go to, oh, can, I, can I drop by and, and visit you? Initially, I thought, I'll bring coffee to you, like I do for Kath. And then, same thing, let's speak of the Lord. That's what I do. I speak of the Lord. What do I do? What, when I say speak of the Lord, what do I actually do? This. And we see God's, how merciful God has been for us. I said, Ron, the last time I saw you, you were in free mental hospital, lying down there, and nobody was around. Now you can get up. Now you can walk slowly, but still walk. Right? You, you say, I have no appetite, can't eat very much. But he ate steak sandwich. Well, I say, you serious? That big one, you know. Ate it. I thought you had no appetite. Of course, I didn't say that in my mind. I thought you had no appetite. But I'm just happy you ate so much. No, this is what, it just lifts us up out of that gloom, out of that darkness, out of that despair. So he's telling uh, his son about it, Clive. He said, you really made a big difference to my dad. You know, he just, just invigorated. What did you do? I don't know. I dropped by, took him out for lunch, talked to him, and went home. It's as simple as that. Well, this too. Can we see God's mercy? Can we see God's hand? He's been so merciful. So I talked about how the Lord has been merciful in his life. You can see it. His great mercy in salvation. So we went back to, well, he brought me on a journey to the war. To, you know, his father was actually almost, got, almost died in the war, went through the Great Depression. This is truly the spirit of a battler. <laughs> then you survive the war, you survive the Great Depression. What else can you Anything else is, what is this? But you know, there's one thing you have to fight too. And that's called, you can feel very dark, very lonely, very depressed. Sure, there are problems. It's not think positive. It's being able to open eyes. Can you see the great mercy of God? And when you can, it makes a world of difference. Everywhere, whether it's to Ron, whether it's to the cat, whether it's to somebody else, the mercy of God. Because everything else is, okay, yeah, yeah, how's your children? How are they? You know, sure, we spend a few minutes to catch up. But those things, just information. I don't go a whole lot onto them. Yeah, so and so is well, so and so is great. But you cannot, every time you, so and so is well, so and so is great. It, and what's the difference? I like this. Made together with fellowship. In other words, in fellowship. With fellowship in Christ. And when you have that, and you understand that, it can make a world of difference. The heart comes to God. Lord, I really come to you to help me battle this sin. To you, you know, if I can understand, He is a merciful God. I don't want to go away from God. I want to go to God. He is a God of great love. What am I running away from Him? Maybe I, I, I don't understand. I'm too shameful to. No, you just come to me. You just come back. This is the story of the prodigal son. You have dishonored your family name. You have wasted your everything. The inheritance that was due to you, you blew it. You have no face to face your father. And yet the story of the prodigal son described that of great grace and mercy and love of the father. He's just waiting for you to come home. My son was dead, but he is now alive. And he celebrates. That parable that Jesus taught was to teach how deep the father's love and mercy really is. You can go home. You can come home. 
Don't let sin separate you from God. Don't let the evil one deceive you, to fool you, to accuse you, to say you are too wretched to come to God ever again. Paul cuts through it with truth because of, yes, we acknowledge, yes, these problems are there. But the, the, the most beautiful word actually is the word but. But, but, yeah, but stops it, you see. But God, who is rich in mercy, that changes things. Yes, sin, dead, yes, yes, acknowledge, yes, guilty, yes, but God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love, which he loved us. This is, you see the word? You can just say, because of his love for us. No, 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 no. Because of his great love in which he loved us with this great love. This is so we don't miss a thing. Made us alive. That's his reason. Even though you were dead in trespasses and sin, he, what did he do? Raised us up together. You see, a person so weak needs to be raised up, right? So help, help those who are older get out of the car. Okay, all right, one, two, up. <laughs> raised up. You know, on your own, a <laughs> little bit hard. A little bit hard. Can I help you? Can, let's raise us. Raise up. It can be a hard thing. But I'm going to raise you up. I'm going to walk with you. I've got to go with you. So when I minister to the older ones in particular, all these thoughts come to mind. It just helps me to appreciate the great mercy of God in my life. I may not struggle physically to be raised up, but I struggle internally. Human weakness take over. I sometimes find it hard to get and be motivated to do something. Lord, raise me up. Make me together with Christ. Mine is on the spiritual part. One day the physical part will come. If I live that long. If I live that long. If I live too long today, you, this, oh, you're very hard. You know, sometimes very hard to get up. You know, the mind is willing. Really, truly, the spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. That is now not a joke anymore. Hey, how come you cannot get up? And last time you laugh at it, now no, I'm not laughing anymore. It's because of your reality. You know, someone else raised you up. Okay, I am going to do it nicely. You know, and they do it out of love. That's the best part. That is the best part. I was very sad. We have a friend in the aged care. She, her name is Dorothy Jones. And see, she's got this terrible illness called multiple sclerosis and MS. She literally needs to be raised up, hoisted from bed to chair, to wheelchair, to wheelchair to toilet. This is why she takes up two to three hours to get ready every morning. And she says, Chris, you've got to pray for me because I think they're cutting staff. Because they raise, they've got to rush to another person. So she was in a position very bad. And she felt, it's because she cannot even adjust herself. Her blouse could be hanging up. You've got to sit down there and nobody there to help you. So one day, one of our young adults went to see her and told me, Pastor Chris, it's very sad, you know. She had to ask me to adjust her blouse, pull it down. You see, I'm going to help you. Okay, quickly do it. I'm going to rush off, help someone, help someone, help someone, help someone. I've done my job. That is not out of love. Neither is it out of mercy. Love, you're not just another person. That I just great love. You know, slow, take, take all the time. It's okay. I'm not rushing anywhere. That's my great challenge. Every time I minister, I want to do it with all my heart. It's just okay. Just, just, are you rushing? No, no rushing. Just, it's okay. Just, it's all right. You gonna rush off somewhere? No rush. This is why I block out my day. Too. I can only visit a few people and not, I can fit 10 people in, but that's meaningless. I'm going to see you. Hi, bye. Hi, bye, 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 bye. What did you do? Say bye to everybody. I like how God does it. He looks at the one person with great love and mercy. He cares for the one person. Raised us up, made us sit together in fellowship, 
in love together in Christ. That is that imagery just drives me, motivate because this is what God has done for me. What I am doing for others is nothing compared to what God has done for me. It's just so precious that I can be identified with the Lord when you care for another person. When you've experienced mercy, you can't but... (laughs) When you've experienced such deep, great love, the heart is filled with love. It flows. So one of my prayer when I began, wanted to serve the Lord was, Lord, you fill my heart with your love. And it's the most moving thing. God has been filling my heart with His love year after year after year. And I thank God for hearing that prayer. That is mercy. You look at it, it's just, it's okay. God has been so merciful to me. When I sin against Him, I was sinning against Him. He showed such grace and love that caused me to change. I remember this when I went to, or was in boarding school. I had a housemaster who was, he's like the father to, because we were there and our parents were you know, away uh, at their home, we were there. And I had this housemaster, he was like a real wonderful role model and a father. He's the father to his own children. We all know he loves us. Imagine, when he left, you have 120 boys crying, that's unusual. Because he loved every single one. Now, his love is going to be quite tough too. He, he, you know, you, you go and do stupid things. You break the school rules. You know, you feel so bad because he loved you so much. You know, that's one thing that stopped a lot of us from misbehaving him. Not because he was an angry man. and No, he was just, he was just so motivating. So we always, he, he's called Mr. Fairburn. And he is... He will be there to support us in everything. He would cheer us. Like he, we always say he swallowed. He doesn't need a microphone. He would call out your name from one end of the oval. Chris, go! You know, he, all he had to say that I ran faster. Our house, Signet House, boarding house, was topped everything. He would be there cheering this one, this son of his, this son of his. We're not even his physical son, but you are entrusted to me. You are my son's kind of a thing. He will be everywhere. We were just fired up because of him. Sadly, he had to go poached by another place and then he had to go. It was a sad day of our life. If a human being can do this, how much more God our Father? What? drives me. I began with what drives you? Not the world's love. That's terrible. Nothing. It leaves you high and dry. But the love of the Father. I've done wrong. I've betrayed His love and in His great mercy and love, He loved me. It stops me from, I want to change. See, now I want to change not for myself, not for, I want to change because I know I'm deeply loved. I want to do better. And I know that whatever it is, the Father loved me anyway. It just drives you. If you can understand God's love like this, then you understand what it means to know the merciful God and His great love. This is what drives me. This one text, this special text, a mercy, a God who is this merciful his great love. And I, we pray, our Father in heaven, what comes to your heart? Well, there's a Father who loves you deeply. That what, that's what drives me. I don't want to, I don't do well. Chrissy, I, we, we received her report card. And there she was. She says, yeah, I said, I'm pleased, Chrissy, you just, you just, Carry on. It's not, not all A's. She didn't get all A's. Ah, that's fine. You know what I look for? Just the word effort, outstanding. You tried your hardest. That's all. And I'm proud of you. You got a C, which is not an A. But my friend got A. She, she's upset. I'm not. 
Not that I want her again. See, I says, you've tried, and that I am pleased. You've just tried your best. I loved you. It is not your grades that I love you. I love you because you're my daughter. I've got, she got an award uh, for music. She got A, A, A. Does that make me love her even more? No, I loved her already. I'm glad for you. I'm just happy for you. But the word that I look for is not her A's or her B's or her C's. It's just effort, outstanding. She really just tried. And I know how hard she tries. Because I'm there spending time with her doing her maths and a bit of here, a bit of there. And the mother, not, and Aldine, if anybody also outstanding effort is actually the mother. Yeah. She gave a lot out to it. And then just to see her do improve a little bit better. She's improved a little bit more, a little bit more. Great, I'm just proud of you. Happy for you. It is yours. Like I say, if human being can respond like that, how much God our Father. It is not your A's that He is impressed with. It is not your... He just loves you with a great love. To see you driven by this love, to see you filled with His love, and then it lifts you up out of whatever it is to try a bit better. That's it. Wow, let, let this word fill our heart and mind this morning as we worship the Lord shortly. What a great Savior we worship. Truly a great Savior. Don't just see the salvation, see the person who gave you salvation. God who is rich in mercy because of His great love in which He loved us. Okay, let's pray together. Our Father, we thank You so much so very much and we cannot even comprehend how great you, you are truly in your mercy that you would forgive that you would just receive us back we can't understand why you would do this and we thank you for these wonderful words because of your great love help us not to doubt this love to understand it, to let it be real to us, to know that you truly are that great God of love who loved us individually, who loves us as we are. And like many who are prodigal sons, you just want us to come home to you, to be loved, to be guided, to be cherished. And our hearts long for that love. We just long to be loved. We just long to be accepted. We just long to be cherished. And we can search the world for this love and cannot find it. Because it's not in the world. But it is in you. And so help us to come to you. To know that you are our Father who loves us so much. May this worship that we are going to have very shortly be refreshing, be renewing, to be filled with your love all over again. Open our hearts to receive this love, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.